initially was viewing this for just the Ukraine story. But then, you know, I watched a little more of it and it, and it was other shit. So this is more of just a, a an analysis of meet the press's propaganda. Meet the press. So they're going to touch on a couple of different things. Um, so let's watch and remember we're getting to five or 600 likes is the target 600 likes is where we're targeting so hit that like button if you're brand new and we got a lot of people that are brand new hit that like button here is meet the press with chuck todd and a lot of propaganda this sunday defending democracy one year after russia invaded ukraine president biden promises to stand strong against the threat from Vladimir Putin. Ukraine will never be a victory for Russia. Never. But what does victory look like? And are we giving them enough to win the war or just survive it? Are we giving them enough to win the war or just survive it? Why does it seem like corporate media is always more hawkish than our government? And our government is very hawkish. But corporate media always seems to be like, wait, wait, are you doing enough? Are you giving them enough? Are you doing this enough? And you see it there even in this opening. Back to uh, Meet the Press. If you want victory, we have to do more. Plus wow. rising tensions. You are coaching Chinese in Keep a safe distance. All your written safety. As the U.S. continues to warn China about sending weapons to Ukraine, tensions are rising in the South China Sea. Is the Pentagon preparing to move more troops to Taiwan? My guest this morning, the National Security Advisor to President Biden, people about Jake kill us. and Republican Senator Dan Sullivan of Alaska. And off the rails. I sincerely hope that when all of the politicians get here, including Biden, they get back from touring Ukraine, that he's got some money left over. Donald Trump travels to the site of the toxic train derailment in Ohio to bash the Biden administration for focusing more overseas, creating the first real split screen moment of the 2024 campaign. The first split split screen moment of the 2024 campaign and Joe Biden will lose. Anybody will lose if if Donald Trump stays with the stance of peace in Ukraine and I can negotiate it right away, he will win in the primary and he will win the national election. He will literally be the only person saying that. Nikki Haley, Mike Pompeo, Pence, they're all gonna be pro-war. They might slightly, oh, it's not a it's not a uh you know blank checkbook. We already reached that point, sir. That might be the only difference they're gonna you're gonna see in the primary. But if Donald Trump goes pro i'm sorry if he goes anti-war peace he's winning you see you see the the popularity in uh uh the ukraine war is fading that's why they're doing all this hand wringing oh we're gonna stay till the end because they're telling us uh we don't care if popularity is fading we're telling y'all right now we're staying to the end more meet the press Joining me for insight and analysis are NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Kristen Welker, NPR White House Correspondent Tamara Keith, Republican Strategist Al Cardenas, and journalist and author Jonathan Alter. Welcome to Sunday. It's Meet the Press. From NBC News in Washington, the longest running show in television history. As the war in Ukraine enters its second year, the question is, what will victory look like? It's pretty clear. Clear no one involved, not the United States or our European allies, Ukraine or Russia, can afford for this war to be in the same place it is today, going into year three, a year from now. And yet both sides, President Biden in a surprise visit to Kyiv and Vladimir Putin this week in Moscow, prepared the world in a surprise visit to Kiev. We notice when we're talking propaganda, notice when they decide to insert adjectives. 
that's key because that's them kind of signaling this is the point this is the part or point where we're really trying to tell you what to think to think for a drawn out conflict one year into this war putin no longer doubts the strength of our coalition but he still doubts our conviction he doubts our staying power but there should be no doubt our support for ukraine will not waver nato will not be divided and we will not tire <laughs> we decided to conduct a special military operation step by step we will continue to resolve the objectives that are before us they started the war and we used the force in order to stop it now biden's visit to ukraine was the first time in modern history that a sitting u.s president has visited an active war zone without a u.s military presence and biden has hitched his legacy to the success of this war can he afford for it to drag on into the year 2024 and the inevitable presidential campaign the American public is already divided on providing ongoing support to Ukraine, split 49-47 on whether Congress should provide more weapons and funding. Isolationism among Republicans is growing, with the leading presidential hopefuls out there right now trying to show some distance from the Ukraine war. On Friday, despite Ukraine's request and a growing bipartisan course in Congress, President Biden made it clear he is ruling out providing F-16s for now. Meanwhile, Russia has sustained nearly 200,000 casualties, eight times higher than U.S. casualties in the two decades of war we waged in Afghanistan. Moscow's winter offensive has so far delivered just minor territorial gains. The only potential beneficiary of a protracted conflict may be China, which offered a peace plan, by the way, that Ukraine did not reject out of hand. The U.S. did, and it is still left. The U.S. rejected it. The U.S. rejected the, the latest peace deal. It wasn't, the U it wasn't Ukraine. Remember how people say, oh, we got it. Matt Dust in particular and Marianne Williamson said it uh, on this show. No, I'm sorry, on uh, Status Quo. Oh, well, they're a sovereign country. You can't just negotiate and they're not ready for peace. Really? How are we, when it comes to peace, it's we can't just negotiate peace over their heads. They're a sovereign country, but we can stop peace? So it just goes one way, huh? It's absurd. Oops, sorry. Still leveling accusations that China is considering providing lethal aid to Russia. U.S. officials tell NBC News uh, that intelligence suggests that aid includes artillery and ammunition. But as U.S. officials sound the alarm, on Friday, President Biden downplayed the threat from China. I don't anticipate, we haven't seen it yet, but I don't anticipate a major initiative on the part of China providing weaponry to, to, uh, uh, to, to, to Russia. And joining me now is uh, the president's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan. Jake, welcome back to Meet the Press. Thanks for having me, Chuck. I want to start right there. Secretary Blinken last week and you throughout the week uh, have been very serious uh, uh, seriously concerned over what China could be doing. President Biden seemed to downplay that risk there. Is that, is, that, is that his gut, or do you have new intelligence suggesting the Chinese are backing off? Well, we have the same intelligence that we've had that has been behind the comments Secretary Blinken has made and what you just heard from President Biden, which is we have not seen China yet provide military equipment to Russia for purposes of fighting in uh, the war in Ukraine. We haven't seen it yet. We're continuing to watch. We'll stay vigilant, as President Biden said. Uh, but so far, we haven't seen it. Do you have a sense of what they're, why, why they would make a decision to do this? What would be their strategic reason for doing it if they did it? It's a great question, Chuck, because I don't think it is in China's interest to do this. I think it would alienate them from a number of countries in the world, including our European allies, and it would put them forced. It would alienate them from their European allies, the same people, UK, Canada, and a couple other people, Scandinavian countries. It would alienate them from the white chauvinist countries. That's it, Jake. Jakey boy, that's all square into the center of responsibility 
for the kinds of war crimes and bombardments of civilians and atrocities that the Russians are committing in Ukraine. Their weapons would, in effect, be used for the slaughter uh, of people in Ukraine. So you mean like our weapons and mo our money goes to buy the weapons that's used in Yemen, that's used in Israel or Palestine? Somalia? This guy can't be serious. So I think it would be ill-advised for China to move forward, but of course that's a decision Beijing is going to have to make for itself. Um, other than saying there would be consequences for getting involved, um, you or anybody else has not uh, laid out any specific consequences. Why not? Why not go public with what could be the consequences, whether it's on sanctions, whether it's more... It this is what I'm saying. You, you see, why is, why is the media always nudging the, the, the government? Why aren't you doing more? Or is this just a dance? The government wants to do more, so they come on their PR arm so that they can be like, we're just doing this, and then the PR arm is saying, do more. So, oh, okay, we need to do more. Okay, I guess we will just follow what they say, right? do this all the time, specifically around military funding. It's weapons or troops to Taiwan. Why not lay it out in public? Well, we believe that this is better done directly with Chinese counterparts in private. And in fact, Secretary Blinken had the opportunity to meet with China's top diplomat at the Munich Security Conference just a few days ago. So we have channels to be able to make sure that China fully understands the U.S. position and what would happen were they to move forward with this step. And we don't see as much profit in microphone diplomacy on this. I, I understand that. Do you have the Western allies on board with the, 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 the immediate response that you want to do with China, or is that going to be a slog? We've actually had intense and very positive uh, consultations Aha. with our that NATO means, allies. No, they don't uh, have other... everybody on board. <laughs> That's what that means. No, they don't, sir. So we're going to uh, move along in their propaganda spin here. Let's move along to the, is it the Republican. Yeah, let's move along to the Republican. Yeah. All right. Let me rewind a little more. Monday on NBC. Welcome back. No issue illustrates the shift in the Republican Party better than the war in Ukraine right now, where traditional hawkishness on Russia has been replaced by a deep skepticism of U.S. involvement overseas, particularly when the policy is led by a Democratic president named Joe Biden. <laughs> now, Washington Post poll this month, 50 percent of Republicans said the U.S. was doing too much to support Ukraine. That's up from so just they're trying to percent the trying same to... thing in April of last year. This GOP. So what they're trying to do is make this seem like it's just the Republicans who are against freedom in Ukraine. It's just Republicans. And that's what they're that's what he's trying to paint in this segment here. Um, so I'll go back just a tad here. Illustrates the shift in the Republican Party better than the war in Ukraine right now, where traditional hawkishness on Russia has been replaced by a deep skepticism of U.S. involvement overseas, particularly when the policy is led by a Democratic president named Joe Biden. In a Washington Post poll this month, 50 percent of Republicans said the U.S. was doing too much to support Ukraine. That's up from just 18 percent who said the same thing in April of last year. This GOP split was on display this week as a handful of congressional Republicans who are supportive of the, of the Biden policy in Ukraine met with Ukrainian President Zelensky in Kyiv. While back here at home, most of the declared and likely presidential hopefuls were striking a more skeptical tone about it. So, and I think the other three now have to kind of be more skeptical because of the stake that, uh, because of the place that Donald Trump has said. Donald Trump has said, I can negotiate peace overnight. If I was in office, this would never have happened. So they're not going as far, Mike Pence, uh, DeSantis, and Nikki Haley, because they're they're neocons, all three of them. They're not going that, but they're uh, they're using language as oh, I'm being skeptical about it. They're being skeptical about it. But uh, Donald Trump is the one who kind of laid the marker 
uh, from that point. Because I don't think if he was the way he was or his stance, I don't think the rest would have uh, fell in line the way that they did. Known about Ukraine, with really one notable exception. World War III has never been closer than it is right now. We need to clean house of all of the warmongers and America last globalists in the deep state. Well, they have effectively a blank check policy with no clear strategic objective. So they're playing these clips together, but you can clearly hear the difference in what Trump said in his clip, not saying he believes it, what Trump said versus what DeSantis is saying. And this is what I'm saying. He's saying this, we're going to, to, to uh, we're close to Armageddon, Humans, like the end of human, the human race, we need to pull this back. And he's more of, oh, this is the blank check. We need to see what's going on. That's all they're saying. So that's, so that's the difference. So let's rewind 15 seconds and play again. World War III has never been closer than it is right now. We need to clean house of all of the warmongers and America last globalists in the deep state. Well, they have effectively a blank check policy with no clear strategic objective identified. And I don't think it's in our interest to be getting into proxy war with China getting involved over things like the borderlands or, or over Crimea. I don't think we need to write them blank checks, but they have the passion to fight for their own freedom. Give them the ammunition to do it. There can be no room in the leadership of the Republican Party for apologist for Putin. Needless to say, there's going to be a robust debate on the presidential debate stage there. But joining clown me now shit. is Republican That's Senator Dan Sullivan of Alaska. He's a member of the be. Senate Armed Services Committee. He's also a colonel in the Marine Corps Reserve. Oh, the only oh, member great. Right now of the United States Senate that does currently serve in the military. Senator oh, he's Sullivan. He's likely probably, you mean CIA. That's what you're saying? CIA, GOP, Press. something like the CIA Democrats. Morning, Chuck. Good to be on the show. Um, let me just start with the basics you heard from the National Security Advisor there. Um, what does what do you think victory looks like for Ukraine? Well, you know, I think just to begin with, um, looking at the past year, we need to recognize how we got here, what mistakes were made, and what can, what we can do going forward. I think one element that the National Security Advisor doesn't talk about, I think it was clearly some of the Biden administration's weakness on issues like energy, national defense, and clearly the botched withdrawal from Afghanistan that emboldened Putin to undertake the oh, brutal God. invasion of Ukraine. I think, though, that now that we are in this battle, yeah, oh, they're, it's they're, strongly in our oh, interest. We're on opposite sides, but they're still towing the same line about how the war began and how we got here, red or blue. Same line to continue to support the Ukrainians uh, to restore their territorial integrity and their sovereignty without committing U.S. forces. But, you know, Chuck, your interview actually highlighted one of the problems. Jake Sullivan's talking about, well, we're not going to do F-16s today. That's for another time, not right now. That has been a pattern with this administration from the beginning where they have slow-rolled critical military weapon systems you know it's a long list. It's Patriots, it's HIMARS, it's tanks, and now it's F-16s. And to me, that is a real blunder. We need to get them what they need now. And listen to the Ukrainians. Right. Um, so no is he better? Is the Republicans better? They're saying, stop slow rolling this shit, give him all of it at, this, at one time, and cut the check off. How, is, how are they better? What's better about them? But let's fast forward to one final spot when they get to the uh, panel here. Let's get to the panel. I don't need your introductions. Let's just go right to the conversation. We will stand with you. Let us move forward with faith and conviction and with an abiding commitment to be allies Back it up just a little bit here. Oh, good Lord. Goodness. All right. Um, we really had our first split screen moment. And I'm curious, Kristen, I'm going to play it here. Um, essentially, uh, uh, it was Donald Trump 
what I thought was a risky move, holding a campaign event in East mm -hmm. Palestine. Here he is. That's a risky move. We will stand with you. What? Let us move forward with faith and conviction and with an abiding commitment to be allies. I sincerely hope that when your representatives and all of the politicians get here, including Biden, they get back from touring Ukraine, that he's got some money left over. The president in an interview on Friday was was uh, pretty defensive of mm -hmm. the response, basically saying, hey, we were there from the beginning. EPA was there from the beginning and all of those things. Behind the scenes, any regret at the optic problems here for them? They weren't there from the beginning. Joe Biden still hasn't uh, gotten there. So this is what they do. They go, yeah, 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 we didn't do nothing wrong and there's no problem. But what's happening behind the scenes when they know something's wrong here? So let's let's listen, though. They're pretty defiant, Chuck, but I have to tell you privately, some allies of the president are concerned that he hasn't been there yet and they're saying he needs to go. But I've pressed them over and over again. Are there any plans for the president to go? And they say there are no conversations about that. They reiterate what you just said. We were on the ground within two hours of this crisis happening. We've gotten all the resources there that are needed. And I do think big picture, there's a question. Optics are important when you're dealing with yeah. a crisis like this. There's no doubt about that. We learned that during Hurricane Katrina, for example. The question is, will this backfire on President Biden yeah. if he doesn't go? But could it backfire on former President Trump? Oh, here because we go with the spin. Yeah. Here we go with the spin. Here we go with the PR, the PR arm of the Democratic establishment coming in here, inserting something completely not that should not be here. And trying to flip the story, but the story has come has has gone down too far down the path. We've already covered how Joe Biden, Mayor Pete is getting demolished over this Ohio derailment and their pre-planned uh, little show they put on for the one-year anniversary in Ukraine, the Palestine derailment. The East Palestine derailment completely was not part of the plan and messed up their plans. Go back a little bit and listen to what she said again. And optics are important when you're dealing with yeah. a crisis like this. There's no doubt about that. We learned that during Hurricane Katrina, for example. The question is, will this backfire on President Biden yeah. if he doesn't go? But could it backfire on former President Here we Trump? Go. Because his visit yeah. has put in the spotlight the fact that he rolled back a, a hundred environmental... It, it hasn't put in the spotlight any of that. You're just bringing it up right now. Because... With your logic, how does that how does that bring in how does that bring Trump under the under the uh, 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 microscope? But it doesn't bring the Democratic establishment, the Joe Biden administration, all of the squad, all of the progressives who voted to break a strike. You see how they're pretending like they're unbiased. This is all to shield. For the democratic establishment and regulations right. and so that's become a part of this conversation no one has well. so it i think that not. there are risks involved for both of them and the question becomes will we see president biden yeah. on the ground in the coming weeks at this point in time still no plans for that camera i sense that almost they don't want to look like they've been pushed into anything by right. fox news and oh because they're they're tough right they're mochismo Donald Trump. Right. Is that, are they being stubborn about this? And this White House doesn't like to feel like they're being pushed into things. They have resisted other calls for him. He, he's got to be there. Um, though this weekend, they've told us that the CDC, the EPA, and FEMA are going door to door checking on people. You know, the government are their is names here Joe Biden? Have kind of a thing. So uh, pushing back on the idea that these people are forgotten. I don't know if if yeah. everyone is going to want to knock on their door from right. uh, three right. federal agencies, but. Th that's what they're going to get. You know, President Biden, though, has a habit of showing up late to just about everything we think significant. In Florida, during the campaign, the Florida Democrats were saying, hey, these guys are here every week. You haven't shown up. They're calling us socialists. you got to come defend us. And he finally showed up like 
three weeks before the election after right. one year of being prompted on the border. He just showed up at the border. Right. Why shouldn't he have been there long before? And now in this incident, he had a good reason not to be there, right. but he has this reputation preceding him about being places too late. I just don't think the split screen hurts Biden at all. He's oh on a very God. successful trip, and his messages were the arsenal of democracy. Mm -hmm. The FDR message so, He's backing the modern Winston. We already know who Jonathan Alter is. Garbage. OK. Um, this is, has not been successful at all. It has not been successful. He has been dragged through the mud for being in Ukraine instead of being in East Palestine. And all of the PR arm of the Democratic establishment and media can pretend like they haven't. But that is a fact. Winston Churchill, Zelensky, right. what is Trump doing? He's saying to the people of Palestine, uh, have a good time. He's handing out. So they're trying to act like this is a bad thing. This is a terrible spin, um, terrible attempt, I, I mean. Um, but they could have just be looking at it this way, the Democrats. Um, it's Ohio. Right. Right, went in Ohio. There's no chance for us to win Ohio. The fuck I care about going to Ohio. And maybe it's that. And it's more likely it's probably that. MAGA caps. Right. That's not a very good impression for him. And and I was yeah. in Poland with President Biden. And just to add to that point, he was making this broader case. This war is not just about the war in Ukraine. It's about democracy. It's about upholding American ideals. And his surprise... I can't even listen to that nonsense. So we can uh, we can end this segment uh, here, and we're ending it on Meet the Press is is a show along with these weekend political shows where they have a lot more time to go in depth into some of the most the most important stories that they need to propagandize people on. And that's what Meet the Press, Face the Nation, and This Week, I think it's called, with George Stephanopoulos or something like that. Um, that's what these shows are for, is to go in depth in, in sort of the biggest story that they need to propagandize people on. Usually it's war, um, and when it's not big war time, then it's usually the economy. Something they're always trying to gaslight, lie to people, and propagandize people. 